Can I get everyone's attention, please? Can everyone take their seats, please? Hello, everyone. Uh, as you know, my name is Giancarlo Carra. I have the honor of being the city councilor for Calgary's Ward 9. I'm in year eight of my great neighborhood's political mission, and a lot of you around the CMRB board table know me as GC, which I take to be affectionate. Um, something else that I take to be affectionate is your constant ribbing of me, of how much I've talked up our next speaker, uh, Mr. Peter Calthorpe. And I've been asked by Jordan and Lisa to do the introduction in this much more intimate group than we had assembled last night with thanks to BUILD and the Calgary Library for for a cool venue and, and a great evening of conversation. I have in my hands in front of me the excellent introduction to Mr. Calthorpe that uh, Lisa gave uh, with all of his awards and accolades, but I thought I would do my introduction in a little bit more personally. Um, as many of you know, I came to municipal politics after a 10-year career in sustainable urban design. and. I sort of came to urban design through an epiphany where my quest to figure out how to do well while doing good in the world sort of centered around this profession that I, up until the moment I realized it existed, I didn't know it existed. And I had a very uh, great time in school at the University of Calgary in the Faculty of Environmental Design, which was really founded by a bunch of change the world hippies in the 1960s who were really ahead of their time. Environmental design was established in 1970 and it had this mission of sort of interdis in an interdisciplinary way connecting all the flailing strands and building a better world. And uh, I discovered in my quest for urban design this movement called the New Urbanism. And the New Urbanism um, really was an open source network of best practices that is constantly evolving and it gave me the opportunity as a young punk to step into uh, a position of expertise because there was 20, almost 20 years of, of open source trial and error that I could plug into from the get-go. And one of the founders of this movement, Mr. Peter Calthorpe, is here today. Uh, he also, I think, was a sort of change the world 1960s uh, hippie and he started thinking about how to save the world, and I think he was architecturally based, I think he was like solar power based, but like a lot of, I think, the thinkers who really sort of fueled the origin of the new urbanism, he quickly realized that it's really about how we live together in the context of human settlement patterns. And uh, I think in 19, 92 or 93, he published The Next American Metropolis, which was a state-of-the-art best practice in the project of the new urbanism and how to create more sustainable, walkable communities. And by 2000, 2001, he published, you know, right at the vanguard of new urbanist thinking, uh, The Regional Metropolis, because the, real, the realization was that you can't save the world one neighborhood or one town at a time. It really is about the relationship of everything to everything. And since then, uh, Peter has gone around the world and done and really sort of pushed the envelopes of what regional planning is. You know, he's the guy who invented the term transit-oriented development, which we all use. Uh, he designed a regional planning system based on that, but deeper uh, analytics and, and data analytics and all of those things, and we're going to get an interesting conversation today and a lecture from him, which sort of gives us a window into that life's work and really, I think, sets us up for the deep thinking and the integrated deep thinking that we need to do now that we have the opportunity to work together as a region and talk about how to celebrate everything we have going on here and make it better and better into the future. So without further ado and without all the sort of accolades, I'm going to ask Peter to come up and... Uh, live up to all the hype that I've been pushing at you guys for so long. Thank you so much. Hey, uh, hey, you know what? I didn't get mic'd up, did I? Oh, well. 
can you hear me here? Well, you know, I can stand. It's okay. I'm getting old, but standing's okay. It's good for you, just like walking. Um, let's see if I can go back here. Uh, I wanted to start with a kind of global view. And, you know, th there's always a kind of rush to let's get down to business right here and right now. But I think it's very healthy to kind of really understand what's going on in the world at large, you know, because it's, it's kind of true. I started with buildings, and then I started talking about neighborhoods, and then it was towns, and then it was regions. And now, as I'm older, I'm a complete megalomaniac, and I think about the whole planet. Um, but th there's something really big happening, which is not only has the human population migrated to cities in a profound way, up to this point, we're now 50%, three and a half billion people living in cities, but we're gonna double that by the year 2050. So in the same time span that we get to solve for climate change, we also get to solve for how to urbanize the planet. Uh, you know, basically doubling the amount of city footprint. Uh, so if we don't get that right, I don't think we're gonna have a chance to solve all the other problems we wanna solve. Uh, poverty, economic growth, environmental sustainability, climate change, uh, you know, social health, human well-being, all these things aren't, are gonna go off the track, off the rail, if we can't get our cities right. And, and so, you know, that's why I become more and more focused on this question of, well, what is the paradigm? And, and how does that a paradigm fit how do we shape the paradigm so it fits like a glove in each unique place? But this is a very, you know, actually, can we get the lights down on the bottom of the slides? Who's in charge of lights here? None of you, huh? <laughs> Nobody's gonna appoint themselves in charge of the lightmeisters? You, maybe back there. There we go. See, yeah, if you complain loud enough, because um, actually the type, the type here is too small for you to read. But cities are, are really where all the issues come together. They're all interconnected here. We live in a world, no, the wrong, what, the wrong direction. Uh, we live in a world where everybody's, no, totally wrong direction. Less light on the stage. Let's put the, the light on the audience today. <laughs> Have you guys do this. Anyway. Um, the, what was I saying? Uh, the, the cities are the one place where all the issues we're confronting come together, intersect, and interact. Uh, yet we tend professionally in, in public institutions, in private institutions, everybody's operating in stovepipes. Some people are concerned with affordable housing. Other people are concerned with traffic. Somebody's involved with the ecology. Somebody worrying about water. Uh, tax income and fiscal balances and profits. I mean, everybody's got their niche and nobody's got the lights at this point. You had it there, whoever's doing it, you had it, but. Um, so this diagram kind of lays it out, connect the dots. Now, it's not just that it's really complicated and it looks like something that nobody actually wants to wrestle to the ground. It's that solving for one can solve for 10. And whenever you get a chance to, to engage in something that involves co-benefits, where you can, you can resolve many things simultaneously, you know you're on the track to something that's really efficient and also something that's really sustainable. And so when you think about urban form, when you get it right, e ecosystems, housing, uh, energy, carbon, all these things can get better simultaneously in a way that Actually, before you start applying the individual technology, the individual solutions, there we go, um, can make, uh, uh, can have a much bigger impact. And so I think that's why I'm so focused. I've always battled with the, for example, the climate change people. They always think it's just about uh, technology, conservation, uh, renewables. The truth is, it's about how we live. That's the most fundamental thing. How we live determines what we demand of the environment, what we need from one another, uh, and how healthy we are, and how connected we are. And that's the start of everything. And so if we go to the source, treat, treat the uh, cause, not the symptom, 
um, we've got to think about how we shape cities, and we have an amazing opportunity to do that at this point. So looking around the globe, um, you have to diagnose the problem. And the problem is sprawl. And by sprawl, I don't mean you know, low density development. I mean disconnected development. Environments that disconnect people from the environment, disconnect people from one another, disconnect people from their daily lives, make them get in cars and be isolated, uh, and fractures cultures into age, separate age groups, separate income groups. Um, the more we separate the things, the less synergy we have, the less power cities have to do what they're most magical at, which is create the synergy of human culture and human economies. Uh, and so there are many forms of sprawl around the planet. The one we're all familiar with, of course, is, is low density sprawl. There's nothing wrong with anything in that picture except that it's all disconnected. Everything is disaggregated. Nothing is coming, uh, nothing is interconnecting in ways that create that, that happenstance synergy, which is actually, many economists now identify as the source of economic um, uh, growth in cities, is that interaction that creates all the synergies. The other end of the spectrum is high density sprawl. And you think, well, it's high density, it's, it's not sprawl. But in China, they've figured out a way to make high density into sprawl, and it's called super blocks. And they isolate massive segments of housing and residential towers from anywhere anybody's going, and they separate it all with big arterials. So I'll get into each one of them. And the most painful one is low-income sprawl. Most of the developing world, Asia, Africa, Latin America, where a lot of growth is happening, the poor are being relegated to the periphery, really distant, out of the flow of economic and cultural and social opportunity. Uh, and that kind of isolation is painful. So there actually is isolation at a regional scale and isolation at a neighborhood and town scale. Out of all that, we uh, have been developing design principles. And about eight years ago, I got invited to China to talk to them about what was going wrong, because there was a lot going wrong with their cities. And so over time, we evolved through a set of experiments, a set of best practices. And I've come to believe that they are universal. They're for everybody, they're not just for China. Uh, and they start with this one, preservation. In China, this was, you know, 20 years ago, uh, nobody thought about preservation of ecology or agriculture or history. It's just bring in the bulldozers and build it as fast and as cheaply as you can. Now, you have to hand it to them. They, they took 800 million people out of poverty. Never in the history of mankind has anything that uh, significant happened uh, to, the, to the lower income population. And so tremendous success. But now they're pivoting and they're saying, well, it's not just about fast and cheap. It's about well, how can we create high quality living? They're transitioning as we did. I mean, we, this country started 98% uh, agrarian and now it's 2% uh, on average. This is how people become wealthy and interconnected. Um, so preserving natural ecologies and cultural heritage, this is now an adopted, these are all adopted principles in China uh, of best practice along with metrics to because they need to rule from above and measure things. But, and this is something that we do already. I mean, we have our environmental impact reports and all the rest of that. And yet at the regional scale, it takes on a very interesting difference. Um, you can save a wetlands in a neighborhood, but thinking about the regional ecology is a whole nother matter, and it's, it's one that's on the cutting edge. Mix. This is the heart, uh, the antidote to sprawl and disaggregation. And by mix, I don't mean just shops and housing. I mean uh, different age groups, different income groups, uh, different activities, cult bringing culture, enterprise, uh, and, and living and recreation all together. And how interconnected that can be is really how great the cities can be. And when you look now with uh, developers, they understand that what they need to sell is not houses but communities. People are willing to pay for great communities, communities where they know each other, communities where they can age in place, where the seniors don't have to get put off in a separate domain. Uh, communities that actually have young people as well as families. Uh, 
there's an incredible value here. And when we started the new urbanism, the development community didn't quite get it. And now that we've built a lot of it, they totally understand. And this is where the greatest value is for them. So there's a win-win here, because it's the best thing for the public sector as well. Walking is, of course, the most fundamental human activity. And it's the one that leads to the health of people and the health of the planet. Um, and we all go on vacation. We all go to places we can walk. And there's no reason we shouldn't do that right at your home, too. Um, Biking, of course, in China was a big thing. Everybody says, oh, don't talk about it here in Calgary. It's too cold. Excuse me, you know, in, in uh, Stockholm, uh, bi walk bike is at 65% of mode split. That's a wealthy country uh, with a pretty tough climate. Um, hardy people is what we need, actually. Um, Connecting gets to the urban design side of it. There are universal standards for how big a city block is. Our bodies are the same size, you know, that they was 2,000 years ago. We can see, we can recognize a face a certain distance, human scale. We can hear people from a certain distance. Um, you know, the scale of the environment has to be matched to our body. We can walk easily a certain distance, the quarter mile walking radius or the half mile walking radius. These are universal metrics that we can use to shape the environment in ways that really take care of individuals. There's no future for cars. I hate to say this, but I mean, it, it, it's, it was a, an event that took over our cities after World War II. Prior to that, we had a very healthy balance. We had rail and street cars and we had cars and everything kind of was in a balance and kids could walk to school and ride bikes and we could ride bikes and walk and there was a balance to how we got around and now we've thrown it off 85 percent of trips in cars is not a balanced community it's not a balanced life uh, and we need to enhance transit and i think that there's a next new generation of technology that's going to make it really easy for that to happen and we need to focus the structure, the paradigm of the city, not around freeways and cars, but around transit and walking. Where do we bring those features together? How do we construct a city so that there's a healthy hierarchy between walking, biking, transit, and yes, still cars? So let me go quickly to um, Mexico, which is an example of, of um, low-income sprawl. These are two pictures. One is uh, uh, social housing, low-income housing, and the other one is, a, a inf they call it informal housing, but it's self-built. And that's actually a much more interesting place, and it's cheaper. Uh, they're both at the periphery. This is a good uh, anecdote about the stovepipe thinking. The people caring about affordable housing think, well, the cheapest land allows us to build more affordable housing. So let's go get the cheapest land. It happens to be a three-hour commute from the job center, literally, in Mexico City, a city that bad with roads that bad. And the penalty paid, of course, is that the people who live there aren't easily part of the economic diamond uh, the opportunity set for the city. Uh, and so this issue of adding together the cost of housing and the cost of transportation, which has eluded us, is at the root of a lot of the problems. Our problems in 2008 in the United States were that people were traveling farther and farther to get cheap housing on large lots. But they weren't calculating the cost of transportation. It costs by AAA, it's about $8,000 a car. Owning a second car in a $40,000 a year household is a big deal. Uh, and so this thing of understanding the, the nexus between transportation and land use lets you see more clearly what the trade-offs really are. But if you're sitting in a stovepipe, you're not really seeing that. Um, and of course, this is what they have in Mexico City, complete gridlock everywhere. So the next topic here is analytics. We're drowning in data, and that's the good news. We now have tools that we can understand and analyze and really clarify the challenges, the opportunities, um, the innovations and the insights that we can get. It's part of the, the uh, digital age uh, phenomena. And planners really haven't had the right tools, and they're just coming online now so that we can think 
at different scales very easily. So here's some of the analytics we did. This is where the wealthy live. They're all in the center of the city, where the history and the culture and the economic vitality is. Uh, this is where all the jobs are. Notice that they're synonymous. This is an analy analyzing the accessibility. Accessibility is really a key issue for the middle class, for everybody, really. Who has access to what kinds of activities and services? So the, the best spot in the center is walkable proximity to jobs and transit. And then you have all the other types of proximity, which are mixes. But what's most frightening for Mexico City is that uh, two-thirds of the population has neither. They're not proximate to jobs, and they're not proximate to transit. It's a frightening thing. But we can now understand, we can map out the city. Here we're mapping out the city in terms of urban form. And a lot of the urban form there is quite good. It's interconnected, walkable, and fairly dense. Why? Only 30% of the population in Mexico City have cars. The other 70% necessarily have to live in places they can walk and use transit. Now, using transit in Mexico City means that three-hour commute, because you're on colectivo buses that disconnect and run slow and run in congestion. So we can understand this, the place at any scale, and we can also analyze futures. So our process is always to be first to offer the public true information and insights. You can't ask the public to make intelligent choices if they don't have in the intelligence. So you've got to give them all that information. The second thing is you have to get, engage them in shaping their vision of the future. It's not about us and the elected officials and planners to do this. It's for the communities to do it. Scenario planning is the method you use, where you say, well, here's three or four different scenarios about how we're going to grow. They, they capture most of the ideas that are in people's heads. And let's analyze them against a a cross section, so we see where the, the, where the lines coincide, where the co-benefits exist. And I always say when uh, this is the, the three scenarios, I won't get into it, but it, it's more about an illustration of the process across di different assumptions about housing location and infill and uh, transportation investment and the quality of development, all those things you can vary at different degrees. And, mix and match create scenarios. But what's powerful here is that across all these metrics, uh, the vision that was created there was actually was a winner. And so what I like to say is that uh, whenever you have co-benefits, when you solve for, I wonder whether this is a pointer, it is. So this one is really important. Uh, whoops, yeah, I'm gonna be hitting too many buttons at once here. Uh, what is that? That's travel time. So travel time really became a, a key issue there because of this gridlock and lack of access. And it turns out vision is minus an hour. But you're also saving in uh, uh, VMT, uh, air, water, uh, which of course is important here, energy, infrastructure cost, which is what balances or, or throws off the uh, books for most cities, uh, land consumption, all these things are favorable. So because these are what I call co-benefits, you have an opportunity to create coalitions. Different groups with different concerns can see that they have common interests and they can join together. When they do that, you get political traction. And when you get political traction, you get the possibility of making change and moving forward. As long as everybody's just focused on their one piece of the pie, the environmentalists just care about ecology and the social equity people just care about uh, housing costs, you don't get very far. But when you find the commonality, you do. And I think that's probably the most important message I have for you today. So I'll stop right here. Uh, no, I won't. No, you're supposed to say no, don't. <laughs> China. So, you know, look at this. You know, you, you put on a face mask before you get off the plane when you arrive in Beijing. We, a couple weeks ago, we had bad fires in California, and we wore for a couple weeks these face masks, and we felt like Armageddon, that, that the world was ending. And yet that's the everyday world that these cities are creating. Uh, and in order to bring everybody out of poverty, it's mass production. It looks like it just came out of a factory and got rolled out like a carpet. 
Uh, and now they're saying, yes, it's placeless. It's, people don't even know where they're living or who they're living near. There's no sense of community, no sense of identity. Um, the streets are deadly. Uh, there's no more mass bikes moving around Beijing. It's just cars in gridlock. This is the history of the place, though. Wonderful, human scale, local markets, small shops, people knowing each other, people walking. Uh, it may sound utopian, but it's actually what people really want. This is what they're getting. This is a super block with 5,000 units, no sidewalks, no shops, nothing. So they end up getting in their car or walking out to the bus stop on a giant arterial. This is one of those super blocks where people are breaking the law and building their own little businesses and creating that sense of place and identity. So uh, sometimes we just have to watch what people do in order to understand what people want. This is a, I know this looks bizarre, but this is actually the master plan for a big section, a new town outside of Kuming in the west of China. Uh, and you know, when you put streets every quarter mile, they have to be big, because they're the only way to go. And when they're that big, eight lanes with some frontage roads, you can't even get across it easily. Well, no, you can't even get across it, period. Um, what we were able to show is that you could take this, the exact same amount of development and the exact same amount of pavement, and create this. So the same investment can get you two profoundly different outcomes. And I think that's true everywhere. You, the same investment uh, can get you much better outcomes if you think about urban design enough. This little slide transformation actually changed the way people in China thought about what they were going to do next. So I'll give you some case studies here. This is the small city of Chongqing. It has 30 million people in it. It's about as big as Canada, uh, but it's just one city. Uh, and this study area is for 4 million people. The most radical thing, of course, was to start with topography and ecology and say this is the foundation of the future communities. And that they were used to just mass grading their way through it. And so we, we, we show all the land, the repairing quarters and the river banks that have to be preserved. That's the beginning of good regional planning and urban design. The second thing is, of course, we have to understand where the existing development is and where the highways uh, that are, are actually being built. And we need highways. I'm not an advocate for eliminating the car. I'm an advocate for balancing the car. If 70% of the population doesn't own a car, how much should we invest for cars versus other people? These are the um, areas that you could walk or bike through without ever hitting an, an obstacle. And this is the metro system and the walking radius around each one. So the idea of transit on development has a lot of traction there now. They know that everybody can't can or shouldn't have a car, and they know that walking and using transit is really what's most healthy for people and for the environment. They asked us to do a case study, and so this is one of the TODs in that area. Um, it went from super blocks and single-use zones to mixed-use and human-scale blocks, same site, just shows that you can make these changes very easily. We preserve the topography and the riverfront open space, the best place for all. Um, and this is the green space network that's connected with green streets all throughout and to the metro center, preserving the hillsides as well as waterfront. Um, so this was an image that got a, a lot of people in China just said, well, why aren't you developing at all? I mean, we need to develop. Uh, and we were able to explain, no, we actually got the same amount of development in this smaller footprint, and we got it in a better way. Small blocks, unique places, uh, variety, and streetscapes that were walkable. This is a network of auto-free streets. Now, we don't get to do auto-free streets too much in, in North America, but I think in most of the world, they make a lot of sense. And they make a, even more sense when, like in Curitiba, they become the uh, transit corridors. Um, why not have places where bikes, pedestrians, and transit have free flow? Why congest every street with cars? Um, why not create an alternative that's truly attractive and actually functions so well that people are willing to, 
to trade uh, driving alone. Um, and so the new regulation in China is an auto-free street every kilometer on grid. Uh, they love, you know, straightforward, easy to measure standards. Take out the rule, ruler and the, the, the guy at the planning desk says, okay, that's, you have the right amount of auto-free streets. But it doesn't hurt. We had a rule when we laid out North America, we laid it out on the one mile grid. And you know, every mile we have an arterial. It's not as if there aren't these kind of um, m paradigms that we work with. Why not change them? What if every half mile we had a greenway for bikes and trails and, and kids to run down? And maybe for uh, uh, buses. So let's come here finally. We all know what we do and what it results in. The bad, you know, the bad news I'm gonna tell you is that you don't have enough congestion. And so I'll, I'll come back later when you get fully congested and you have to actually do something different. Uh, but you know, I noticed a little bit of it coming over today because it was rush hour. So it's, it's gonna happen. The reality is, and it's for so many other co-benefits, getting people out of cars for health, for community, uh, is a good thing for the environment. And we've had a lot of experience working in regional plans in all these major cities across the United States. And I kind of developed this methodology of get the data, create um, uh, the alternatives that people care about, express their dreams and visions, and give people the information about the impacts. That's the simple step. Urban footprint is a tool that we created over time doing that process and then finally it got picked up by the state of California with their new growth management uh, land use laws that call for sustainable community strategies across the state and it's now being used to implement that, measure it and see what the consequences are. So it's now a pretty sophisticated tool. It allows you to zoom from the regional to the city to the project easily so you can see the implications of a big idea on an individual neighborhood. Uh, and so too often in these big plans, it's just large policies and large goals, and it's beautiful words, but it doesn't have that much that's concrete in it that I think is really important. It works this way. You can access data. Now, the bad news is, is we don't have it loaded up for Canada yet, but maybe we're going to soon uh, with data. Um, and we have everything from parcel data all the way through all the environmental and so census tract and social impact and uh, fiscal financial information. I mean, it's kind of amazing. And we can layer all these things. I'm not going to give you examples uh, in a pretty sophisticated way so we can ask questions, ask the most interesting questions and get maps that give us answers. And then the scenarios I've explained, this is... Uh, really important practice, and I'll, I'll drill down a little bit more with some examples there. The multi-metric analysis and then the consensus. The goal is finding consensus. The goal is finding common ground for where we want to go. And the fact that we are able to do all these analytics basically in an afternoon. When we started doing this, we started in Portland, which was kind of famous for its urban growth boundary, and we proposed a west side light rail instead of the a beltway freeway and it took us two years and two million dollars to get through just a third of these metrics to be able to demonstrate that maybe it would make more sense to build the west side light rail than the beltway freeway uh, and now we can basically push a button and it will be done and so we can test many ideas through the whole process. We can, we can continuously do what if this, what if that, what if we change this policy, what if we made that investment, what if we change this zoning regulation. All of that can happen in real time now. So we have something that I think is a game changer in terms of what uh, those of us that are planners and urban designers have uh, in our quiver. Vision California was the first place we used it for the whole state, and we said, well, what, what happens in California if we grow one way versus another? Uh, and the typologies are actually pretty simple. Footprint works by actual statistical bases around different urban environments producing different consequences, and we can measure all that because we have the data. 
And so here are three, you know, simplifying it down to three urban typologies. One is San Ramon, it's sprawl. The other one is Rockridge, historic streetcar suburb designed around people walking from uh, Elm Street to Main Street, kind of that, that old world with, with cottages and bungalows and small lot single family mixed in with uh, Main Street shops and, and apartments on the corner and things like that. Really great environments. And it turns out that's actually at, at the missing middle. That's where most of the market is now, uh, at least in, in North America, in the United States. And then San Francisco is a city. So you know what this looks like. The sprawl is subdivisions and malls and office parks, everything isolated, uh, everything surrounded by parking. Um, these old streetcar suburbs are a great paradigm of exactly the market segment that's most in need of community and housing. We overbuilt in the United States large lot single family remote, and that's what basically drew, uh, drove the economy into an, uh, a nosedive. Um, now we actually have to backfill. In California, we have plenty of large lot single family. It's already out there, it'll circulate in the market. What we need is more compact housing closer to jobs and closer to transit. That's what the market really needs. And so figuring out how to produce more of this is really the key. And then of course, there's a lot of young hipsters who want to live in the city, and uh, God bless them. And uh, hopefully we can even get to a point where families stay in the city. Um, but the differences are astounding between those three simple typologies. There's a, uh, almost a, a three and a half to one difference in carbon emissions between the city and sprawl. There's a two to one difference between that compact streetcar suburb and the uh, suburban model. And that, that streetcar suburb is only two and three story buildings. There's nothing you know, radical about it that you wouldn't see. As a matter of fact, I think we dro drove by, there was a redevelopment of a military area here that has a lot of these qualities, and I'll, I'll show you that. So it's not like uh, nobody wants that. Uh, land consumption, 15 to one difference. Uh, VMT, which of course drives so many different things, vehicle miles travel, uh, is a three to one difference. And, uh, and all that's happening at the same time that the market is telling us through value per square foot that uh, people actually will pay more money for those more urban lifestyles today. Uh, and this is apples to apples. That, that uh, the sprawl out in San Ramon, that's high-end sprawl. That's golf course communities, gated. It's you know, supposed to be the top of the market, single family in the Bay Area. And you compare it to Rockridge, which was a really old neighborhood, but it's got so much character. And people know each other when they go to the local store, all that good stuff. I, you know, I took this out of the other slideshows that I've done. And excuse me, this is the fourth one, guys, so I'm getting a little dry uh, doing this. Um, but I took this out, and I realized that maybe y you guys would appreciate looking at this. So the product mix, the existing in California it, under business as usual, is small lot, large lot is around 60, 70%. Um, the new stuff is a much higher proportion of uh, small lot and, and townhouse, and actually no, uh, no single family. Now you would think that's, that's ridiculous, that's not viable. Well it turns out that when you blend the new the, with the existing housing stock, the end result is actually quite balanced. So you get over here, uh, and this is the housing mix at the end of the day. And so this is the most urban, this is business as usual, this is where we are. You'll note the, the quantity of multifamily is just about the same in all cases. And what you're doing is shifting more into townhouse and small lot and uh, a little bit less in the large lot, which is the direction of the market. I mean, this is a no, another global phenomena. The middle class is not as wealthy as it was. And it's probably not gonna be. The question is, is the, does the quality of life have to go down? Or whether or not actually they can actually have a higher quality of life. We've been growing house, house sizes. In the 60s, the average house in the, in the United States was 1,100 square feet. And that was the American dream, you know, you had a, you know, that was like, the, that was what the whole world was envious of. And we were about three and a half 
uh, persons per household. Now we're down to about uh, two and a half or even less in many regions persons per household and the average square footage is 2300. So let's figure this out. Is this really what makes life great? Uh, more isn't always better. Uh, you know, the other thing to recognize in this housing demand thing, and I don't know what the demographics are here, but in the United States, only 24% of households are now families with kids. The other 76% are others, singles, uh, couples with no kids, empty nesters, elderly. The single largest cohort in the United States is single people. It's pretty sad, or maybe it's not sad. Maybe that's what they want to do. But, uh, and so this mismatch, we have this notion that we're building housing for families, and yet families only represent a quarter of the households. Um, and so getting real about who, what phase of life people are in and, and ha how much housing diversity we need, this is something that needs to be part of every good analysis. The, and so what we did was we said for the whole state, for this 50 million at 2050, we can have business as usual, largely sprawl. We're growing smart, this is largely streetcar suburb. And the results are stunning. The differences are so much bigger than anybody recognizes. And each one of these bar graphs re represents a special interest group that can now begin to see common cause with the other ones because they all are co-benefits. They're all attached by good urban design. So land consumption, it's the farming industries, it's the environmentalists, they all care about preserving land. And of course, uh, a lot of people who live in urban areas want open space nearby. Uh, and we can see it here. In LA, in 2050, would look like this under business as usual. And it looks like this with the growing smart. It looks like, gee, we're forced everybody into high-rise apartments. The reality is we've put people into bungalows and townhouses and uh, within walking distance of local shops and schools and parks. VMT goes down. Uh, you can see where the VMT is. It's very much always, the more we build at the edge, the more we build vehicle miles traveled. It's a pretty simple relationship. And so um, the more infill we can find. Now, this is a region that probably is growing at a rate where you're going to continue to have greenfield. But the greenfield development can be more diverse and can be more connected by transit. This is the reverse of it, which is walking how much people walk in various segments of LA. The dark blue are not lakes, those are high, high walking zones. Uh, but what's uh, fascinating is that that's the direct linkage to one of the health criteria. The more we walk, the healthier we are, less heart disease, less obesity. Uh, and we now have the tools to actually measure the consequences. The more walkable places we produce, we can actually calculate the health impacts, the health costs. Now, you guys don't have to write checks for your health, so uh, you, maybe you don't pay attention to this, but we do down there. And, you know, number, I don't know what the list is, you know. Uh, is it climate change? Is it health care costs? Is it affordable housing? Uh, I think actually the biggest issue for us now is immigrants because it's been hyped up. Uh, but, you know, when people really think about quality of life, it's about health. And, uh, you know, the, the fact that these kinds of communities generate healthy people as well as healthy environments and communities is really big. Once again, if you can put a number to it, it's more potent. Um, revenues and costs on a city basis, we can calculate all that. We have to put in all the factors and the tax base and all the rest of that. But it's pretty easy to project. If you build this kind of development in this city, this is what's going to happen to the to the revenue, and this is what's going to happen on the operations and maintenance side of things, uh, and this is what happens in the capital expense. And of course, the raison d'etre for this in California was the greenhouse gas emissions. So in LA, this is a city, the, the famous automobile city has now done a complete flip. Uh, they now have passed bond initiatives for $400 billion in new transit starts. Uh, they have zero dollars in their RTP, the Regional Trans Transportation Plan, for new highways. They're basically saying, we got enough highways, we're going to build more transit. And it's kind of amazing to watch. So this is what they have. This is the expansion of light rail. 
This is their, their uh, commute train and the expansion. And then the most powerful is this really dense network of BRT. We know the BRT is the most cost-effective form of transit, and they have boulevards all across uh, LA that make this possible. And of course, if we could get light rail, it would be heaven. You know, I've watched in China over five years, they've built an interconnected high-speed rail network that spans the whole country. And in five years in California, we had a ballot initiative affirming that we were going to build high-speed rail, and we haven't. We, we are building, I think, the first 20 miles of it. So this is the resource when you talk about BRT. It's about taking these environments and adding transit and infilling development. This, you know, this idea of actually taking those ribbons of places that are the least desirable in our communities, the arterials, and turning them into mixed-use environments that enhance accessibility. And that maybe are places where you can walk to and actually do something. Um, there's urban infill that we can do. Uh, we can transfer a lot of parking lots into um, housing. We can infill along the boulevards, which you can see here in Berkeley. Uh, we can take the brownfields. There are many, many places within the existing communities where we can enhance infill. But infill is not the complete story. Uh, the upper left there is the existing, the old industrial, and then this is the mixed-use community. It's all built out. It's a great neighborhood now. I want to give you one example that's maybe I, I went looking for something that I thought would be close to Calgary, so don't be insulted if I say Salt Lake. But it's a very conservative place. It's about a million and a half population, and the planning exercise was how to add the next million people. Uh, and it's a high plateau. It has some pretty unique cultural uh, aspects, like the Mormon church and probably the most uh, Republican legislature in the country. Um, so it's a real test for smart growth. I mean, you, you know, this is a, a very conservative environment. We started there with a simple exercise in how, how do we shape the scenarios there? So I thought, why don't we give people maps of the region and we'll give them chips to scale that represent the next million people at the, at the um, scale uh, uh, of current development there. And so if they're going to keep going like they are, they have to find a place for all these chips on the map. And we got every, even the governor was there trying to figure this out. This is a little bit of something I feel is really important. You have to turn the public uh, away from being problem staters. Tell us what your problems are. Show up and yell and scream and get angry to, okay, let's sit down together and try and find solutions. So we turned them into problem solvers. So the prob first problem was, okay, if a million people come here, where do they go at current densities? We did this three workshops, 500 people came. The end result was that not one single table came back without doing one of two things, either stacking the chips to represent higher density or putting chips on existing developed areas to represent infill and redevelopment. And this was a community that thought that the answer was always a subdivision at the edge. This is the mentality that everybody had, especially with the Mormon church and, you know, 10-person households. It's kind of a, a stereotype, but a little bit true. It turns out the Mormon church uh, wants their kids to stay, and there was no affordable uh, first-time uh, home buy opportunity. Uh, and there's nothing, you know, over time, the, even eight kids leave the house, and uh, there, there was no place for the, the older people, the empty nesters, a rare breed in the Mormon world, uh, to go. And it, then it also turned out that, of course, the Mormon church organizes their communities around walking radiuses to the local ward. So the idea that there would be a walkable zone within a neighborhood was kind of intrinsic to them. And when they said, oh, if that's smart growth, we're for that. So it's a very interesting thing of peeling the onion. Um, but this exercise, very simple. Uh, actually, most planners don't do it at the, at the regional scale. I mean, you have to see how much land you're talking about when you're talking about the next million people. And you have to think hard about where it goes and how dense it is. 
So we built our scenarios, and of course, we had the outcomes. And a lot of people say, well, Peter, you're always cooking the books, and you know, it always comes out the same. Well, it always comes out the same because that's the truth of it. I mean, there's no question that if it's more compact, it's going to consume less land. There's going to be less VMT, and there's going to be, therefore, less emissions and less water consumption and all the rest of that. It's just a matter of how much. This was the most important. Every place has its kind of key issues that drive a lot of the politics. And because it was a conservative legislature that were true fiscal conservatives, they did not want to waste public dollars. And they saw that smart growth actually reduced infrastructure costs. It actually eliminated the need for a major new dam, reservoir, and water system because the water demand was so far down. The state legislature got behind smart growth. And lo and behold, uh, they passed a piece of state legislation that is probably the most aggressive land use policy in the United States, more so than Oregon, the blue state. Um, and it, you know, it stipulates where open space will be preserved along the Jordan River, around the Great Salt Lake, uh, in the Ochre Mountains, where there will be transit investments and where centers will be enhanced. And literally, and the last one is, mapping of where infill should be directed and new growth, which is the yellow area there. So a very progressive outcome for a, a place that a lot of people thought, yeah, yeah, you know, they're so used to building a uh, large lot, they, they could never do anything else. So this is a pretty interesting evolution. Now there's a big site in the middle here that we got a chance. This is a big greenfield site, but it was owned by Kennecott Copper, who owns these mountains. And they asked us to do a master plan there, 4,000 acres, 20,000 units. And this proved the point that you could mix lot size, housing type, community centers, uh, TOD, there's a, a train stop right here, uh, that you could create a mixed use environment uh, that really worked well in the marketplace. So a lot of the builders there were worried about doing anything other than their straight ahead subdivisions. But now that they've seen Daybreak uh, and it's built, um, they understand that this is actually a much more powerful position in the marketplace. Now there's a little trick in here I'm going to talk a little bit more about, which is when you have a big arterial coming through to a freeway interchange, you tend, and here too, that tends to divide the community. So what we do is we turn it into one-way streets, you can see here, so that no street is too big to cross. And literally, right here, we have a little main street spanning between them, so that all the traffic has easy access, but pedestrians can come and go easily. And that, this is what that looks like. It's a pretty great uh, main street. This is actually when it's just finishing construction, no people. I should get some people. Um, townhouses get built, mixed in with single family and cottages and uh, little pocket parks and all that kind of stuff. I think you all probably know this paradigm of the new urbanist greenfield. It works, and it's a big component. I think there are two big components. One is let's reinvent the arterial and the strip, and let's make sure that the next generation of greenfield growth is mixed and uh, accessible. So in terms of that infill idea, here's the Bay Area. And the crisis in the Bay Area is housing. You know, we've created 600,000 jobs. I mean, Silicon Valley is a success story in terms of jobs. Only 60,000 units of housing. What does this mean? It means that the middle class is you know, basically dipping down into very affordable housing stock, what used to be affordable housing stock, and pushing people out of there. And the affordable housing is going way to the periphery or nowhere, and we're getting more and more homeless. So this, this thing of not supplying enough housing. I mean, you can talk about affordable housing and subsidies and all the rest of that, but the first order of business is to just supply enough housing for the jobs. Otherwise, that imbalance will drive all the economics nuts. So I decided, we're using Urban Footprint, to just look at one street. This is El Camino Real. It's the historic street where uh, the Spaniards came up and settled uh, California, so it has real cultural significance. Uh, I asked the question, how much housing could we put on there if we just took all the strip commercial? We didn't touch any of the neighborhoods. We just converted strip commercial which is going belly up because of Amazon anyway. Uh, it's, a, you know, it's a huge land reservoir. 
undervalued. How much could we get there? And we did the analytics. This is what El Camino looks like. Through the richest economy on the planet, it's a junkyard. I mean, it's horrible. It's kind of tragic. So, and we, this is the existing zoning, and this is all the parcels of land that footprint turned up that met our criteria for FAR and par surface parking and all the rest of that. Um, long and short is we get 250,000 units of housing in a housing mix of townhouse, three-story, and four-story. No high-rise, no high-density, absolutely standard marketplace product. And it gets mixed in with existing single-family neighborhoods in a way that allows people to actually have a destination on El Camino. They can walk there. There's cafes and restaurants on the ground floor, and they can get to transit that way. So the next issue was, okay, a quarter million. By the way, a quarter million households is about the population of San Francisco. I mean, it's a stunning amount of, uh, of opportunity. And of course, compared to spreading that housing out, all the metrics are good. I'm not going to spend any time. So the, um, the issue of autonomous vehicles, everybody says, well, that's going to solve the problem. We don't have to worry about transit. We don't, everybody's going to be moving around. The reality, of course, is that there's, it's just going to generate more vehicle miles because there's going to be something I like to call the zero occupant vehicle. If the SOV, the single occupant vehicle, is bad news, just wait till you see cars running around with nobody in them. And they will be. They'll be deadheading. They'll be sent to, to, to run errands. If somebody comes to work from a, a really remote location because they can work on the way, and then they send their cars five miles away for cheap parking, and it you know, doubles back once a day. This is going to be a nightmare. It's a lot of research on this. You have to drill down. but. It's not going to work. What is going to work is BRT upgraded with the next generation of buses, which are autonomous buses. They're being built and used right now in China. You give them protected right-of-ways, and the autonomous technology is ready to go today. Um, th these ones actually just run on these little dashed lines. That's what signals them. But in your snow, that wouldn't work. You'd have to. You, you need barriers anyway because you want to keep cars out. The key to what I call autonomous rapid transit is that it has a dedicated lane. Uh, it moves faster than light rail because if you use small vehicles like the one in the background there, they can cluster the origins and cluster the destinations and run skip stop or express the whole way there. What slows down transit is stopping at every station. And so this, with the t intelligence of our our little uh, handy dandy phones here, um, you can order up a bus that's going to your destination. It might stop once or twice for somebody else, but it'll go straight there. Here's the analytics on how this will perform, and it's pretty exciting. Um, the, uh, the speed of it, because of the skip stop, is about 30% better than light rail and BRT. So it's around 23 miles an hour on average instead of 18. And bus, you know, local buses are way down here at 11. You wonder why everybody stays in their car? It's because this is just way too slow. And these are just in a few locations because it's so expensive. 25 million, how much is your new light rail going to cost per mile? Not to point to a certain issue right on the table right now. A mile. A kilometer. Wow, so it's even more per mile. So, you know, this stuff, BRT runs at about 7 million a mile, and ART will run around 9 million a mile, we calculate. We did the analysis for El Camino Real. Um, this is the operating uh, cost, because without drivers, drivers are around 60% of the cost of a transit system. Without drivers, you're down here at around 10 uh, uh, excuse me, uh, 600,000 per service mile uh, versus uh, double that up here for these. So you save on capital, you save on operating, and you have a faster service. I've been waiting. I mean, I've been the advocate for transit-oriented development, but the problem is transit is so expensive that we can't do enough of it to really change the landscape and the, the fundamental identity and behavior of, uh, of mobility in a city. 
But with these kinds of costs and these kinds of performance, I think we're going to see a complete revolution. This is the next generation. The uh, Google and these guys stumbled into it. They thought they were going to have a huge market with single, with, with private vehicles. And what they've really created is the next generation of transit. And it's very, very exciting, I think. So here we are back at El Camino. So how can we fit a uh, autonomous transit in this, or bus rapid transit? The same 120 feet can be configured this way. 15 foot sidewalks, uh, four foot bike lanes, still six lanes of traffic and the ART. Now, most of your arterials are at least 150 feet. You can do this. You don't need to lose, you don't have to arm wrestle over losing traffic lanes, although I think losing traffic lanes is probably a good thing. But all that we're losing on El Camino is parking lanes. So it's pretty amazing, I think, what we can do to kind of capture the value of that public right-of-way and use it to transform our mobility in our cities. So we really go from this to this. So I'm going to stop there because I know I've talked too long, or should I have a little more? Should I go? I'll just quickly do this. Here you are. <laughs> and uh, we, we actually are doing a project way down here, so I'm, uh, you know, I do a lot of greenfield work, but what's significant about that site, of course, you have a wonderful downtown that was pioneering in its vision around parking and, and transit accessibility. Um, I think you need to take that attitude uh, beyond the city center. Here's your suburban environment. I just did a couple Google shops. And what's tragic about this picture is this is a community center. Here's your uh, school, here's your shopping, or maybe that's office and that's shopping, hard to tell. But none of it is accessible by anything but the arterial. Uh, the, st the street edges look like that sometimes. The intersections like that. And the tragedy is this is the heart of a community, but it's inaccessible to the community. And we thought, well, why not just build one-way streets through this and create easy accessibility to that exact same thing? And we did that. And this particular project here, which was planned like that, and we did it like that, uh, and it got built. Uh, there's actually a community park where the intersection would have been. Um, that's the community park at the center. Those are the streets. The traffic flows through this, this four square intersection are faster than a single point with uh, a four phase light on it. Um, parallel parking, comfortable pedestrian domain. That's even a school right there, pushed right up against the arterial, what's left of the arterial, and acting like an active part of the community center. And the, we actually could put housing that fronts with stoops right on the main street so that all of it comes together, housing, schools, parks, shopping. Uh, there's a grocery store in there. Uh, so this interesting little I don't think this is a gimmick. This is, you know, we've been planning this kind of thing for cities. This is the city of Merced. Every intersection becomes this kind of uh, neighborhood grid that allows everything around it to have easy access. Issaquah Highlands does the same thing. Uh, this is the Microsoft, new Microsoft campus, and pretty dense mixed-use development. But this is the planning for that primary intersection. This is what got built. Uh, and so the, the campus and the shopping and the housing all flow together again. I, taking out barriers, I think, is the key element to, um, and there it is under construction, the new freeway and the couplet. And this is housing that sits, live work housing that sits right on the, the streets in the town center. Uh, so coming back to Providence, the one pitch I have to make here is, you see down here? That's a BRT line that comes right next to my site. I want to make it an ART. Can we make a deal on that? Can we test the next generation of transit in a location like this and see whether it works? Because if it works the way we think it will, it will change everything. So that was the last bit. I'm sorry it took so long on all this. There's the plan. Okay, enough. Now the good part, questions, I hope. Do we have time? I don't know what the schedule for this was. It's 5.30, everybody wants to go home? No?
Good. Do you want to have big questions or uh, uh, reception questions? We can do big questions for a bit and then move up to reception questions. Okay. So there's two mics. Uh, if you want to put your hand up, we'll get one mic to you. Okay, go one here. Or maybe you can just speak a little louder. So um, I just have a question for Bob. I'm a huge fan of what you do. I'm a huge fan of what you do. Uh, you. And I clearly it has huge, um, cl you know, clear implications for um, for high density areas or areas with lots of people. Um, given that the Calgary regional area um, incorporates a lot of the smaller centers, how do you, s how would you um, suggest that this type of land planning um, be brought into like a small town? Well, the two, two questions there. I think you actually already have on the books the idea that when you're building Greenfield, you need a village center and you want to, uh, and I guess I put that piece at the end just to show that there may be better configurations for that. So you, yes, you have a shopping area, but you don't necessarily have to drive to it. It could actually be part of the community and you could co-mingle uh, the schools and the parks and really create a true village center. That's on Greenfields. Small towns, uh, I think that there's a whole range of housing types that are missing or may be missing, and that's one of the first bits of analysis. You just have to look at market segmentation. When we did the state of California and all these big greenfield projects, developers are pretty sophisticated about the market segments, and it turns out, because of changing demographics and economics, that there's a demand for a lot of things like townhouses and bungalows and live work. So within these villages, small scale infill, I think is really one of the big opportunities. Now, the main street shops are always a big challenge because they've been decimated by the big boxes out on the arterial, but we may be seeing a turnaround because the big boxes on the arterial are now getting decimated by Amazon. And so what people really want is Placemaking. They want to. They want to be able to go to a community center and eat, and go to a cafe and do a little window shopping and get their hair cut and all the rest of that. You know, local services. Uh, and there's another ingredient there. I do think more and more live work is going to become an ingredient for small towns. A lot of households have second incomes. They work at home in a, a bedroom or something like that. And if you you can configure housing around that reality and it can actually become more formalized and can play a, a, a stronger role in those historic village centers. So those are just some ideas. But the thing about um, existing villages, it, it's just you got to be very specific, very contextual. Um, I don't think there's any big, you know, silver bullet there. Um, I think that if we can make transit ubiquitous, and more accessible, throughout the region, and you can steer it towards those village centers, and that will make them more desirable places to live. And so economic revitalization will be more natural. So it's partly big ideas like, uh, you know, the regional transit network, and it's partly small pieces finely cut to fit. What other questions? Come on, guys. I know I said something controversial. Got to. Hi. Uh, nothing controversial. Just wondering, when you start a regional plan, what's the very first thing you do? What's your well, first job? Uh, normally we arm wrestle over the program. You know, because a lot of communities say, what, we don't need to grow. I'm here. I have my place. Why does anybody else have to show up? You know, there is a mentality of, well, maybe no growth is the answer. Maybe that doesn't happen here, but believe me, there's places that I've encountered it pretty intensely. So you have to get realistic. Now, we normally avoid the question. We say, okay, let's plan for the next million. We don't know when that's gonna happen. It could be 2030, could be 2040, could be 2050. Let's not argue about that. Sooner or later, you know, the region's gonna get another million. How do you wanna shape that? What do you wanna do with it? Then comes the part about, well, what's, 
the future of the demo what are the demographics telling us? And on the one hand, you can say, well, you never know. On the other hand, you can look at demographic trends and you know where we're headed 20, 30 years from now just by looking at current birth rates and fertility and immigration and things like that. So you can begin to project housing needs, housing types. You do an assessment of existing housing stock versus affordability and market demand. Um, you have economic development strategies that begin to shape what kind of commercial development you're going to need to put in place and where that makes sense. So you kind of gather the program. Then the next step is you get all the data into the machine and you start cranking out analysis so people really can understand the region. Uh, the ask it questions like where in the region are there real deficiencies in access to parks? Although I've, I've looked at your map and that is not a deficiency here. There are parks everywhere. I've never seen a place uh, quite as rich, it seems. Am I wrong? It seems like I'm right? Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. But you can do that. You can do, you can do analysis like you can say, well, where are um, food deserts? Where, where are places where there are no decent shopping areas? Um, so you do all the analytics so you can inform the public. Then you shape a workshop process that says, let's everybody, all the stakeholders, get together, and we're just going to brainstorm. We're going to come up with scenarios about what kind of future this should be. And you know you can organize it different ways. I gave you one example with the maps. I always like that one myself. Um, and then you do the analytics. In Salt Lake, all the analytics, you know, it's not just a report for planners and elected officials. We actually did an insert in the Sunday paper that explained here, you know, uh, Salt Lake futures, and it just described the different uh, scenarios and gave the outcomes. And there was a little mail back thing that people could say they could vote for you know one of the four scenarios and they could actually write in their comments and that was a pretty amazing outcome because the mailbacks were overwhelmingly for smart growth and this is a conservative place so it was pretty interesting so more and more public engagement and then you know, really building on the coalitions that come out of the co-benefits so, you know, there had been a lot of uh, sharp elbows between the affordable housing advocates and the environmentalists, because the environmentalists had been, you know, let's not build anything anywhere, because it's sensitive land everywhere. Uh, and the affordable housing people were, you know, had a different agenda. They didn't see that they actually had the same agenda. So, you know, finding those, and then you need some really smart politicians to sit these groups together and get them to understand that the common vision will work for everybody. Uh, and that's the magic of the of political process. Is somebody's got to be able to bring those coalitions into maturity. Hi. I think it's on. Yeah. Hi. Thanks. Uh, great presentation. And I don't have anything controversial for Damn you. Damn it. So can we get somebody <laughs> um, who's got something? Um, Early on in the presentation, you had a series of six or seven points with a heading, and and I was just wondering, on the on the connect heading, you talked about sort of scale related universal standards, yeah. and and then there was a mix heading, where you talked about uh, neighborhoods that had different demographics, a mixture of residential and commercial, etc., yeah. and I was just wondering. Um, in connecting those two dots, is there an existing or an emerging standard for how big a mixed area can be? Well, we like to use a walking radius. Now, it depends on what kind of destination, but a, you know, a walking radius is very simple. Quarter mile, five minutes is what people will walk to go to a local destination. Now, to go to uh, get on transit for their daily commute, they'll walk up to 10 minutes, so half mile. So there are different scales of these things. And what we normally do is just think about, well, where are the destinations? You know, the beauty of good planning is you aggregate the destinations so it becomes a more powerful destination. But if your school's over here, your park's over here, and your shopping's over here, you're in your car, right? You're going to go to three different locations. There's no way. So it's not only that you have a street network that connects it all, 
It's that you've aggregated. And it's what we used to call towns and villages. It, we, I mean, we used to do it in our sleep. And it's only modern planners that figured out, oh, it wouldn't be great if we just scattered these around. Uh, I don't know. We've gone off track pretty dramatically. Um, so does that answer your question? Yeah. I mean, it's... And, you know, the block size thing, it's interesting, you know, because we did a lot of studies on that in, in, for China. And globally, what America got laid out on about a, a block size that you, is typical here. It's 320 feet square. Um, I don't know why the surveyors did that, but they did it blindly. But it's the right scale. And you can, we've done studies across the world showing that that's about what's a comfortable pedestrian route is you get to be able to make a turn every 160 feet. And it turns out that when you have streets that frequently, you can disperse traffic over it so that you're not consolidating traffic into only a few. Now, the traffic engineers here figured out how to frustrate that with their, you know, with the one mile grid and then collectors and cul-de-sacs. So actually the only way you can get through is on the one mile grid, which is, means that the one mile grid gets overloaded. And the, you have to use the one mile grid to get to your local destination. That's the worst part of it. So it's an, you know, we gotta go back to network street net systems. Anything else? There's one. I know that guy looks really controversial. <laughs> Controversy. Yeah, mm. let's, uh, mm. there's gotta be a problem somewhere in here. It's not interesting otherwise. Well, I'm kind of from a urban place. So my question would be, um, how hard have you pushed the agricultural preservation agenda and the growing your food close to home? There's lots of interesting graphs and all the savings, but have you looked at the impact of pushing food production further and further away or not further away in terms of net cost of uh, supplying an extra million people with food? You know, the food issue is a whole domain unto itself. And I'm pretty cynical about the local stuff. Uh, you know, if you're a foodie, you want it local because it's fresh. That's great. But if you're really thinking about the global impacts of feeding 9 billion people, uh, you're not doing that. You, you're, 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 you, first of all, you're cutting back on beef. I hate to say that, you know. So the two things you guys got going, cows and oil are really not good for the planet. <laughs> I, mean, I hate to tell you that. Maybe you figured it out. But you know, because we're consuming vast quantities of tropical rainforests around the planet so that people are clearing it so they can grow grain to feed cows. Uh, you know, all the data just shows how intense that is in terms of land consumption. So fundamental kind of shift you know, it's a little bit like walking. It's healthier, but it's a little harder than driving. And maybe eating a little less meat is healthy, but not quite as satisfying as that burger. But, you know, this is the, these are the kinds of trade-offs that in the end we're going to have to make. So I think those big global issues are more important to me than the foodies getting fresh vegetables nearby. Um, especially in climates like this, what the heck are you going to do? Uh, you know, maybe there's green hothouse stuff going on. Am I going to get, I'm trying to be controversial. <laughs> I'm not succeeding. Come on, somebody's got to disagree. Uh, on the other hand, you know, community gardens are another one of those great things that bring people together and add diversity. And they are, can be a great local source. So um, I'm not against that either. What? Have you ever looked at um, energy integration in terms of net heat coming off an urban center and what you could do with that in terms of food production or? Well, I don't know about that, but you know, there's a whole range of uh, sustainable infrastructure that I don't know much about that you can add on top of good urbanism. So you, know, you, can, you can take all the sewage flow and that's a biomass that has real value. It's fertilizer, it's gas, it's recycled water. It shouldn't just be a pollutant that goes out. Uh, and there are you know, anaerobic digesters and all things like that that are already ready to go. And we can do better with our waste. 
uh, and we can recycle more. Uh, you know, it's kind of amazing the deal we have with China is shipping them all our garbage. Uh, I think that's part of the tariff problem we got with them. <laughs> yeah, right, we don't do it so much. But anyway, so I think that, there, and one of the ones that I used to be really excited about, well, I think is coming online is the idea of the microgrid. So you have some local energy, you have local generation, so you don't lose a lot of power in transmission lines. I don't fully understand it, but I know it's a, a term that when you say microgrid, everybody nods and says, yeah, that's, we want one of those. Um, it used to be the cogeneration, I think, was smart. So I bet you this campus has that, which is you have a local generator and you capture all the waste heat, you pump it around, and you use it to heat and cool the buildings. The whole center of Sacramento, the capital where I used to work, uh, is that way. We had a, uh, a generation plant downtown and then all the waste heat went around. So, you know, we lose around two thirds of the energy in, uh, in electrical generation to waste heat. Now, I'll tell you some old time hippie stories. When Jerry Brown was first governor in the 70s, we were really onto all this eco stuff. And so we convinced him to convert that power plant, which was gas, into a biomass plant. So not only was it cogeneration in local electricity, but it was renewable. And it was because we had this big beetle infestation up in the Sierras, and there was all this dead wood. So we got it for very cheap, and we built it. Now, of course, we put it in. It worked beautifully, and Ronald Reagan took it out because it was too good. He didn't want anybody to know about it. He also did a master plan, excuse me, he was before, it was uh, Wilson who took it out. Anyway, I diverge. I will tell you one other story. Sacramento is where I got my start with, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Jerry came in uh, and had to undo Ronald Reagan's master plan for downtown, which was literally urban renewal writ large. So this his historic center with the most beautiful canopy of, of uh, uh, London plane trees, you know, cooling every sidewalk, mixed use everywhere, a traditional town center. And he got the bulldozers out and was building super blocks with high rise office buildings for the state of California. They got two of them built and then, you know, he left and we came in and we preserved the grid and we added light rail and we built a lot of energy efficient office buildings. So it's funny to watch how different politics generate different uh, strategies all along. I'm a little biased, you might tell, on this re in this regard. So now you're going to pull me off the stage. I'm going, I'm getting too political, huh? No, carry on. Uh, no, all right. All right. Why don't we have a reception then? Thank you. Mr. Calthorpe, on behalf of the uh, Calgary Metropolitan Region Board, uh, I want to thank you for your presentation today, but not only for your presentation today, for uh, the, the global principles that you've espoused for us today, uh, the ideas you've generated, the, the examples that you've put forward that are quite relevant to what we're trying to do here. And I know the last two days has been uh, a lot because there have been four presentations know, you are... that you've had to make. But uh, you your, your money's worth this time. Your, <laughs> your enthusiasm, even in presentation four, your enthusiasm for your subject comes through in spades. Good. And we thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm really happy to be here. Reception I, is I, I have to tell you guys, I kind of wish I lived in Canada these days. <laughs> I think you can figure out why. <laughs>